Hello, I'm Fawn. This is John Kobler. And we just want to say a welcome to everybody who's joining us today. And I, I was going to say, I, uh, every time we do this, I have to catch myself because I almost say good morning every time. And I realize that not everybody joining is necessarily joining us in the morning, but it's one of those habits of like, for me, for you know, 40 years, church has been Sunday morning. And just a reminder that the church is not a time slot on, on a specific day, but the church is the people and the people who are engaging with the presence of God. And so wherever you are, hi church, whatever time of day it is, <laughs> hi church, we are so glad to have you with us today. Yeah, and God has a word for you today. So be, be ready for that. Yeah. Um, man, put away distractions. Tune your heart into uh, what God wants to say to you. And if this is your first time or maybe you're getting to know Living Water, welcome. And yeah. my prayer more than anything else is that you receive from God today, that you mm -hmm. leave encouraged, hope-filled, challenged, convicted, uh, but that you, you see God's kingdom becoming more of a reality in your life today. Yeah. And uh, by the way, if you're gathering with a home church and maybe you have not um, registered your home church yet, uh, that's not an ominous thing. That's just a <laughs> connection point for us to be able to connect with you, know you're out there, provide resources. And in yeah. the next, uh, even in the next, I think we're setting something up right now, um, going to be able to, I'm going to be able to connect with you directly, um, more regularly, because I want you to know what God's saying. I want you to have resources as you navigate yeah. opportunities and challenges. And I really want you to know that you're such a special part of what God is doing in this season at Living Water that we don't, I don't want to miss out on that relationship. So go to livingwater.com slash home church. Let us know that you're out there, that you're meeting and you're gathering. Um, Sano will connect with you as well. And then we'll have more in the weeks ahead. So looking forward to that. Ready? Yeah. One of the things that we've um, done every week as we've come together in different places, uh, in different spaces, is come to the, the Lord's Supper. That's another way that communion is referred to because it reminds us and it centers us on what's most important. And yeah. that's that, that Jesus is the center of it all. Mm. And what a way to prepare our hearts as we um, get ready to give and receive from God's word. Um, you may have picked up some of these uh, from the church, ordered them online, or maybe you have something else. But I'd encourage you every week as you come together that you would join uh, with the body of Christ, the church, all mm -hmm. around the world in coming to remember what Jesus has done. It's his broken body and his shed blood mm -hmm. that make it possible for you and for me to know abundant life through him. Hmm. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of him. And that's what we want to do today. Let's receive of the bread. Hmm. And the cup. Hmm. Thank Lord, you, thank you Lord. so much for the gift of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I pray for everybody out there today that if they felt disconnected or distant from you, that even now, as we receive together, your presence would fill apartments, cars, Amen. homes, dorms. Yes, Lord. Uh, that your presence would, would be manifest yes. in people's lives today, that they would experience yes. you and be filled with joy and hope and peace, no matter what they're facing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's also, uh, this is also an opportunity to give. And um, church, thank you for being a generous church. But I also want to encourage you that in the midst of uncertain times, uh, it is um, our hope and belief that God is our provider Amen. that brings peace and security and yeah. stability. Now, you can believe that, and it's powerful. But when we actually lean into that belief, that's when it becomes profound. And giving and generosity is, is one of the ways that the church has done that for thousands of years. So um, be challenged. If you felt like you need to hold back, um, now's not the time to hold back from the Lord. And let God lead you in 
how that looks in your life. But man, now's not the time to hold back. Now is the time to press in in every part of your life yeah. to what God has. So I'm going to pray for you as you give. You can text to give. You can go to livingwater.com. You can give through the app. Um, all of those are ways you can give. And um, I want to say thank you for those of you that trust Living Water to steward those funds in that way. So we're going to pray, and I'm going to yeah. pray for you because you're preaching. Yes, I so, am. So, Father God, we thank you for the <laughs> gifts that are being given. We pray for the community called Living Water that you would make a way and provide for every yes. need represented. And and in that, enabling your church to be a blessing mm, yes. to the city and the community in which we live. Amen. I pray for my bride, and I pray that the fire of God would fall mm. as she preaches the word, and that your word would break down barriers Amen. and walls and Amen. fears and doubts, and uh, that as your word is preached, lives would be transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You got this. Amen. Thank you. Hey, you. You want to hey. take this? <laughs> I'll just take this. <laughs> Thank you. That was so thoughtful of you and so kind. I really appreciate it. <laughs> well, we are uh, still in Matthew chapter 5. And this is, we're nearing the end of this series that has been focused on the Beatitudes. This opening of Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. And uh, the Beatitudes are, Jesus gives us this character sketch of what a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus looks like. And he basically says, those people who belong to my kingdom, those people who love me and are, are serving me, this is what their lives should look like. And, and these people who live this way are a blessed people. So I want to read those verses, all, all of them, and then we will talk about what we're talking about today. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And here are the verses that we're focusing on today. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see a theme, this word that keeps coming up, right? Blessed, 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 blessed. And um, I was thinking about this the other day because I have a necklace that I got at a conference that says blessed on it. And I actually have not worn it in about two years. I just wore it for the first time this week. And it has, it has to, that, that thing in me that didn't want to wear it actually has to do with um, something that was kind of a, a hiccup in my own mind regarding that word blessed. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just blessed. I'm so blessed. Usually when someone says that, it's, it's tied to something like, um, oh, that parking spot at the front by the door of the grocery store opened up. I'm so blessed. Or you go on a, on a flight, you know, you fly somewhere on an airplane and you got bumped to first class blessed, right? Or maybe you have a science test and you didn't really study for it and then you passed anyway and then you say, oh, I'm just so blessed. Um, I have a problem with that line of thinking of putting the word blessed in that category because really um, that's what I will call for this conversation a like a blessing theology. And what that theology is, is this belief that when something good happens to me, that means God loves me. 
and I am blessed. And where that starts to break down for me and, and not line up with scripture and not line up with the word is, is the question I start to ask is, well, what happens when you don't get that promotion? When you don't get a parking spot near the front of the store, when, when you don't get bumped to first class, when you've been praying for a godly man as a husband and you have yet to find him? What happens when, when those blessings are not coming to you? Does that then mean that you are not blessed by God? What about kind of the other side of the coin? What about when, not just when those like extra good things aren't happening, but what about when th things are hard? What about when you face loss? What about when there is grief? Does that mean that you have somehow stepped outside of the blessing of God? And what does that mean for the millions of Christians who, who all across the world right now are genuine followers of Jesus Christ, who are following him and what they know about the word and the spirit and the kingdom with all their heart and soul and mind. And yet every single day they still wake up praying to have enough food to feed their children. Or those millions of Christians who, who, who have church hidden in a living room in fear of being discovered and thrown into prison. Are, are those Christians somehow not blessed by God? I could tell you what I think about that, but I would rather just read you something from the scripture. And this is in Romans chapter 8. This is what it says. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the answer is that the, Je the, the, the blessing, the blessedness that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 5 has absolutely nothing to do with our circumstances. And there is no hardship or difficulty or loss that can ever separate us from God's love and the blessing that is found in him. The blessing that Jesus is talking about has, has nothing to do with physical circumstances and rather it is this deep, abiding, unshakable inner joy that is found in Christ and completely separate from any circumstances that we may be experiencing. Now, what is at stake in not fully understanding that is really something big because if we somehow buy into the idea that blessing is happiness that's tied to good things happen, happening to us, then what's at stake is that when we face hard things, when we face difficulty, when we face persecution, then, then what happens is we begin to question two things. We will either question God's goodness or we will question our goodness. What do I mean by that? Well, maybe I just haven't quite measured up enough to earn God's favor and his blessing. 
And that, that is shaky ground to stand on. So it is really imperative that we wrestle through understanding the blessing and the love and the unshakable inner joy that is promised to God's followers. So Jesus here, it, at the end of these Beatitudes, he actually says something that's, that's really mind boggling. It's so counterintuitive because he goes even one step further from um, you can still be blessed even if you face hard things. He actually says you are blessed when you are persecuted. And when Jesus says this, he, he states it in the passive um, perfect, which basically means it can be translated to say, blessed are those who have allowed themselves to be persecuted. The idea of what he's saying is he's saying, you are a blessed people. You who have been persecuted, you who are so rooted in this inner blessing, in this inner joy in Christ, that you don't flee from persecution when it comes to you. You willingly accept it and submit to it, still rooted in joy. That's incredible. Now, we have to pay attention because he says, um, blessed are those who are persecuted and not just for anything random. I mean, there are a lot of things that we can be persecuted for. And he says, blessed are those who are persecuted. And there are two things that he says. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake and blessed are you when you are persecuted on my account. So blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness and blessed are you when you are persecuted for Jesus. So let's look at those two things. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Now, just a few weeks ago, we talked about the beatitude that says that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And in that, we dug into what righteousness means a little more. And, and for today, just a quick reminder, righteousness is not just being a good person. Righteousness is a complete orientation of your life toward God, toward His will, and toward His priorities. So when your life is oriented fully toward God and his will and his priorities, and you are persecuted for that, there is still blessing in it. 2 Timothy 3.12 says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That is a really strong <laughs> statement. Um, let me say that again. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and, and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed. So Paul makes this really strong statement that anyone who desires to live a godly life is going to face persecution. There's no question about that in his mind. And the reason he believes that so strongly is because he understands that a life that is submitted to the standards and the priorities of Jesus will be a life that stands in opposition to the standards and the priorities of this world. What does that look like? Well, let me, let me paint this picture. If you make it your aim to pursue self-control, your life will be an indictment of excess. If you live simply and with contentment, you will show the folly of craving luxury. If you choose forgiveness, it puts revenge to shame. If you walk humbly, you expose pride. If you are punctual and thorough in all of your dealings, you will lay open the inferiority of laziness and negligence. If you speak with compassion, you will sharply contrast callousness. If you are sincere, 
You will make things that are flippant actually look flippant instead of clever. If you are spiritually minded, you will expose the worldly mindedness of that that is around you. Now, it's important to understand and to remember that persecution does not always only come from those who are blatantly opposed to the things of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus faced most of his persecution from religious people, from the people who outwardly um, could sort of pull off looking righteous and yet their hearts were far from God. So what could that possibly look like, persecution from, from the religious side? Well, if you show grace and love to sinners, that's going to push the button of people who are self-righteous. If you persist in, in sticking to the whole counsel of the word of God and you don't piecemeal the things that, that are the things that you like and discard the things that you don't like, if you stick to the whole counsel of the word of God, it's going to anger people who like to pick and choose what they stand on. If you refuse to listen to backbiting and you refuse to participate in gossip, it might cost you the friendship of somebody that you've sat next to on a Sunday morning. And if, if any of those things, whether you face persecution from those who are against God, or maybe you even face persecution from people who are, are, fall into the religious category, don't lose heart. Don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing good. Because I promise you that the, the blessing that Jesus is talking about, the blessing that comes from aligning your life to the standards and the priorities of Jesus Christ and the word of God, the blessing that comes from that is, is on another playing field than the temporary fleeting benefits that come by aligning yourself with the standards of this world. I promise you, so don't lose heart. So Jesus said that, that we're blessed when we're persecuted for righteousness sake, when we don't compromise in that. But he also said that we're blessed when we're persecuted on his account, when we're persecuted for Jesus. Here's the truth. Jesus Christ is a dividing line. This is what Jesus himself said. I am the way and I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is not one of many ways. Jesus is the only way to the Father, the only way to heaven the only way to a fulfilling, satisfying life. And when you make a decision to stand on that line and not cross and not compromise that, it will invite the persecution of people who are against that. Jesus will draw a dividing line. Now, um, I wanna touch on two dangers that any of us who are trying to follow Jesus need to be aware of. If you're trying to follow Jesus with all your heart and you're trying to align yourself with righteousness and align yourself with Jesus Christ, then one of the things that we need to look out for is um, the danger of compromise. The danger of compromising in order to avoid conflict and rejection from people. And I often hear people say this. I've heard people say, well, I don't want to hurt people and I don't want to alienate people. And 
that turns into a lie that says, um, my, my love for people is preventing me from drawing a line for righteousness, drawing a line for Jesus' sake. And that's a lie because really what's underneath that, the root of that is not a love for people, but it's actually a love for the approval of people that has exceeded your love for God. Galatians 1.10, Paul says this, If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. We need to evaluate our hearts and look out for the temptation to compromise in order to avoid rejection. The second danger that we need to look out for is contention. We need to be careful and look out for purposefully stirring up contention in the name of righteousness. I have really strong feelings about this, um, especially in light of the, the climate in our culture, in our nation right now. But rather than telling you how I feel about it, I just want to read to you straight from Scripture. And this is um, in 1 Peter chapter 3, and which I find really interesting because Peter is this guy who, on the one hand, denied Jesus. He compromised his faith and what he believed in when he, he was afraid of rejection. He was afraid of repercussions for associating with Jesus. He fully compromised and denied Jesus. He's also the guy who cut off somebody's ear in the name of standing for Jesus. <laughs> And he was subsequently rebuked by Jesus for that. Um, but listen to what he says. This is after Jesus is crucified and raised from the dead and Peter is full of the Holy Spirit. This is what he says. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For who does, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. If you want God to listen to your prayers, you need to read this. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Jesus says in, in these Beatitudes, he says that we are blessed when we are persecuted for righteousness and for standing with Jesus. He does not say that we are blessed when we persecute other people because we don't agree with them, because we don't like them, because we don't like the way they live their lives. He also says in those Beatitudes that we're blessed when we are accused falsely. So 
If we're being persecuted for acting like a jerk, if we're being persecuted for stirring up division, for marginalizing people that we don't understand or don't like or don't agree with, there's no blessing when we face hardship for the unrighteous behavior that we are living. There is no blessing when we are facing hardship that we bring upon ourselves for unrighteous behavior. It's really interesting. If you, um, if you go back and look at one of the very first Beatitudes, the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's really interesting because the poor in spirit and those who are persecuted, they share the same reward, the same promise. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's not a coincidence. And so think about it, the, the poor in spirit, the poor in spirit is somebody who understands the depravity of their own sinful soul. The poor in spirit is somebody who understands that it is by grace and only by grace that, that I can even stand before a holy God. And because I understand that, someone who is poor in spirit does not throw stones of condemnation and persecution at other people. Jesus is 100% truth and he is 100% love. He's not 90% truth with a little bit of love or all love and a tiny bit of truth. He, he is all truth. You cannot change what the word of God says. You cannot compromise what the word of God says. He is all truth. But he is also all love. And we can't pick and choose the parts of Jesus that we want to focus on and we want to be like and then just disregard the things that are hard or that we don't like. And if we're having trouble being a people who are both truth and love, if we are finding ourselves angry and throwing stones at other people, especially in, in this season right now. This is, this is what I would ask you to do. Not listen to me. What I would ask is that you would spend some time and you would ask the Lord to show you if, if you are a person who is poor in spirit in every part of your life. I actually think that the opposite of being poor in spirit is being rich in self, rich in self-righteousness. And if the Lord shows you even, even a tiny part where rather than being poor in spirit, you have been rich in self, the answer is actually really simple. Repent, receive his forgiveness. And as I've been praying for you, praying for this message this week, this is what I believe in my spirit, that for any of us who the Holy Spirit will reveal to us a place where we have been not poor in spirit, but rich in self, and he shows that to us and we come to him and we repent and we humbly turn from that thing. That what is going to happen is that the anger that has been festering in your heart, the anger that has been 
just consuming you that you haven't been able to put your finger on why you are so angry that as you repent and you become a person who is poor in spirit that that anger is going to be broken in Jesus name broken in Jesus name and you are going to walk again in the full blessing and joy and peace of what it is to be in Christ Jesus. I pray that for you today. I also want to say something to anybody who is listening, who's looking in my eyes right now, and maybe you have been persecuted by a Christian in the name of righteousness. I'm really sorry. I am so sorry that, that you've been hurt. And I don't make excuses. All I know is that, that every single one of us are, are always in danger of, of going more toward the flesh than the spirit. All of us are always in danger of being deceived by the enemy instead of listening to the truth. All of us have to constantly fight to be a good representation of the heart of Jesus. None of us are perfect. But I also want to say to you that I cannot compromise the Word of God. I cannot compromise the Word of God. And, and Jesus wants to be Lord of your whole life. All of it. He wants to be Lord and have authority over every decision you make, over the things that you love, over the places that you, that you th place your mind, the thoughts that you think. He wants to be the authority over what you do with your body, over the words that come out of your mouth, over, over every single part of your life. And I can't compromise that. That is the truth. He is the way and truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. He's all truth, and yet... Today, you need to hear that he is so very kind and he's so very gentle and he is forgiving. And if you come to him today with your brokenness, with your sin, if you are able to acknowledge the ways that your life has been outside of the things that God calls good and you acknowledge that before him and you ask for his forgiveness. You declare that you believe that he is the savior of the world and that what he did on the cross is for you. And you accept that and receive that and you place him over your life in every way. Then today you can walk in the fullness of his forgiveness, the fullness of his salvation, all the blessings that belong to the children of God can belong to you. And right now I pray for any man or any woman right now who is in that space, who wants to give their life to Jesus Christ today. I pray that it would, that it would happen in this moment, that as they confess their sin and their brokenness, as they confess that they believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, as they receive the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ and they give their lives to you, that they would now be filled with the fullness of the blessing of being a son or daughter of God, that they would be filled with, to the fullness of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. The last thing that I want to say is um, for everybody, everybody 
who is following after Jesus, whether you just started that journey right now, or this is just part of your journey. You've been following him and you're continuing to follow him. Right after the Beatitudes, right after he finishes this whole thing about blessed, 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 these are my people. This is what they look like. You can, you can recognize them because this is how they look. Right after that, in the next several verses, Jesus calls us, his followers, his believers, the light of the world. And he tells us to let the light in us shine so that the world around us can see our lives and give glory to the Father. You are called to live your life in a way that shines the light of Jesus everywhere you go. And the truth is, some people have a closed heart. They don't want to hear it and, and they may persecute you. But some may have an open heart. And when they see the light of Jesus in you, they are going to be drawn to him. And we need to be ready to have an answer for the hope that is in our lives. At the very end of this, Jesus says, if you're persecuted, if the light of who you are is seen by other people and they push against it, this is your response. Rejoice and be glad. <laughs> what? Yeah, rejoice and be glad. And I'm actually going to talk more about that next week. So come back and tune in. But he says, you can rejoice and be glad. And there are two reasons. One, because great is your reward in heaven. And two, because when you're persecuted, you're joining the throngs of all the men and women who have gone before you, who have also been persecuted. You're in good company. So today, as you ponder letting the light of Jesus shine to the world around you, this is how I want to close. I want to read something to you. It's actually an article that I found um, that was written a few years ago, written by a pastor, and it was commemorating the 60th anniversary of the death. Now, this is going to be interesting, but the death of five young missionary men. They died in 1956. And he wrote this article to commemorate their deaths and, and what happened through their deaths. Some of you may know this story. These men's names were Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Ed McCulley, Peter Fleming, and Roger Udarian. Now, I cut some of the, the article down because I wanted to shorten it, but I want to read this to you. The story is one of tremendous inspiration and faithfulness. These five young family men learned about an unreached group, the Aka Indians, living in the thick jungle of remote, remote Ecuador. The Lord placed a great personal burden in their hearts for these people who'd never heard the gospel. They knew that they must do something or risk disobedience to the Lord. So they relocated their young families from comfy American suburbia to the unfamiliar vistas of South America. Through great financial expense and perseverance, they creatively made contact with the Akas, assuring them that they were not a threat. As inroads with these as of yet unreached people were made, the missionaries and their families were encouraged. The men eventually landed their small plane on the almost hidden beach near the tribe and made documented contact with a few curious members of the group. God's mission in their lives was becoming a glowing success. And then tragedy struck. Contact was lost with the missionaries. And a few days later, an armed team from Life magazine found their speared bodies in the riverbed. Clearly, each man and each family had given their very all. But what now? What do you do with that kind of outcome? If their mission was of God, where was he? Where was his protection? Shouldn't their ultimate sacrifices have been met with victory? 
Was any of this fair? Why did something this bad happen to people so good? Jesus never promised that the ultra faithfulness of his followers would be met with the applause of others or the awards of earthly success. Yet, he never blinks when he calls each of us to pick up our crosses daily, surrendering our will and our glory for his. Theologian John Piper reminds us by saying, our calling as Christians is not to stay alive, but to stay in love with Jesus. What happened to the tragically disrupted outreach to the Aka Indians? Well, they eventually were reached by none other than the widows of the slain men, and salvation came to the tribe. For those of you who proclaim to follow Christ, there are no guarantees of a struggle-free existence here in this life, but remember, our reward is not in this world. Our reward is not in the place in which God calls us to be strangers. Our ultimate celebration and crown is in the kingdom of heaven. And so I leave you with the words of Jim Elliot, one of those five missionaries who gave his life. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Amen.